there are two types of people in our world. There are people who like to wake up late, and there are dumb people. Um, <laughs> there is nothing that throws me off more than the alarm on, on my phone. Uh, it it doesn't matter when it goes off. It, it's going to make me um, furious, if I'm being honest. Uh, uh, like I was having a conversation with a friend this week about uh, he, he does a, a juice diet, which sounds terrible, and it, it must be worse than it sounds. Because he's like, yeah, I squeeze radishes, and I love it. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing ever. Um, that fury that raises up in my heart, thinking about only digesting juice from radishes and kale, uh, that's how I feel about my alarm clock. I hate that thing. I hate when it goes off. I hate to hear it. Children kind of force you to be more morning people, but I still want to be less of a morning person. So uh, it's a really weird thing. So, so Doug and I, we met a few weeks ago to talk about this next series that we're in, and the series is entitled Wake Up Call, and that's where we're going to be for the next few weeks. Wake Up Call, major lessons from the minor prophets. I would imagine in this room right now there's a really good chance you've never been through a series on the minor prophets. I, I have taught one series in my life. It was when I was... 25. I was a little more precocious at the time. I'm sure I said lots of heretical things, so maybe this will work better than that did. But we're in the book of Joel today, the book of Joel, and our entire theme of today's message is on the phrase, the great and glorious day of the Lord. I'll say that again, the great and glorious day of the Lord. We'll be in Joel chapter 2, and as you get there, let, let me go ahead and just Lay some groundwork. All of chapter 1 of Joel is about a locust attack. And if you read through Joel chapter 1 and you look historically, we're not exactly sure when this is pointing to, the direction that we've been given. It's this metaphorical idea that, that was literal but still metaphorical. Very odd when you read it. Um, when you look at Joel, you realize that he is saying to the children of Israel, to the nation of Israel, there is, ju there is a great and glorious day of the Lord coming so you need to be ready for it. Now, before you get to the minor prophets, you find that the idea of the day of the Lord was a really big deal for the nation of Israel because if you've not noticed historically, they were always being punished. They were punished by Assyria. They were punished by Babylon. They were punished by everyone. In the New Testament, we see that they're, they're punished and captives of Rome. They were always in captivity Yet in their minds, what took place for them in regards to the day of the Lord was this day when everything was going to be fantastic. And they were going to get something that was immeasurably good. The, the imagination of their mind was that they would be riding around on unicorns and there would be fairies flying over their heads. And if you're like, Chad, you're always talking about unicorns and fairies. I want to be honest with you. I googled magical creatures to find out some new ones. I journeyed into the epicenter of weirdom, and I can't refer to any of that. Let's just go with general ones. But you, you look into Joel, and you see that we're talking about the great and glorious day of the Lord, and, and what takes place for the people is pretty crazy because they're not about to get what they're expecting. Last year, Hope, she, she looked at me, and she said, uh, Magnolia was three months old, and she said, hey, I've got a surprise for you. And I was like, I, she, it's your turn, and uh, your turn. And she said, no, I, I've ordered tickets to, to that comedian you like. If you don't know, I, I think funny people are funny. And usually I think that most people aren't funny. I just like funny people. And this comedian that I like is named Jim Gaffigan. You've probably heard of Jim Gaffigan. He, he's always talking about food. He's this chubby guy. I, I don't know. We, we, we resonate. Uh, and I wanted to go see Jim Gaffigan. And she said, he's at the Tivoli downtown. <coughs> I bought tickets for us to go see him. So... She, sure enough, has bought tickets, and we begin to load the car up. We've got a babysitter. I think she was here, Megan Leonard, watching the boys. <coughs> and while she watches the boys, Hope and I have Magnolia going to this comedian with us. And I thought that was a little odd that we didn't find someone to watch her too, because I know what's about to happen down there. And um, so we, we get to the Tivoli, and we're in line, and it's about three, four, five hundred people deep. And if you've not noticed, the crowd for the stand-up comedian, if you will, is not the most um, socially acceptable when it comes to, to rooms like this. And people were dropping 
bombs. We'll just leave it at that all around us. And, and people are, are smoking in line. And it's it just a, a pretty rough looking crowd. You would have thought we were going to a biker bar. And, and when all this is happening, Hope's just got Magnolia nuzzled up right here. And, uh, you know, in that baby wrap burrito thing. And she looked at me and she said, Chad, this is a rough crowd for a Christian comedian. I said, Hope, who told you he was a Christian comedian? <laughs> she said, I just thought since you liked him, I said, y y that is insulting that you think that I would want to go see a Christian comedian. <laughs> to not get what you expect. I was seven, and my dad was notorious for jacking up his calendar and, and not knowing where we were going or when we were going, having his days mixed up. And, and he said we were going to the lookouts because it was Little Leaguer Appreciation Night. And so he put me in my uniform and this little purple jersey, like, like I was a, a Lakerette or something, and my, my baseball pants, and I wore my cleats, click, 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 click. I've got my glove in my hand. And when we get there again, this crowd was as rough of a crowd as you've ever seen. Like there were just, this was before tattoos were cool. You know, if people have tattoos now, we're like, oh, that's kind of normal. If people had tattoos then, you were like, they are going to rip out your goozle like Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse. <laughs> so we look around the room, and, and uh, we're, we're out there standing outside. I am this little chubby kid in my baseball uniform. My dad's standing there with me. My dad calls him baby. Uh, it's weird. And while we're standing there, he, this man, this was a rough crowd. When we came to find out that he had gotten his calendar mixed up. When we walked inside, and I, I went to my seat, hot dog in one hand. <laughs> there was nothing stopping me from getting that hot dog. And I, I sit down, and it <laughs> doesn't matter who's here. Uh, I sit down, and there, there's no lookout guy there at Historical Ingle Stadium, the, 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 the baseball head guy. Um, there's a ring in the middle of the field, like a, a boxing ring. And I thought, is Hulk Hogan singing a national anthem? What? <laughs> the night before was Little Leaguer Appreciation Night. My dad had taken his seven-year-old in his baseball uniform to the second annual Chattanooga Badman Contest. <laughs> that wasn't cool. They had hot dogs, though. And I remember sitting there watching, and not what I expected. The great and glorious day of the Lord, it's not what the people expected. When it's talked about in the New Testament, when it's talked about in the Old Testament, there's a sense of wonder that's attached to it by the people, and yet when it shows up, it's, it's not that. It's, it's, it's wrath. It's God pouring out his wrath on people. So let's just look. Chapter 2 of the book of Joel, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness, there is spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful people, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through all the generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness. Just imagery there, just for the sake of it. What it's saying is, this army's coming. Chapter 1 takes us to this army. These locusts, whether they were, fit, whether they were literal or not, are a symbolism of what's coming with this army. And everything that they have jumped, hopped, crawled over is destroyed. In front of them is, is, is lush ground. The Garden of Eden reference. But wherever they go, destruction is coming. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. 
That's just three verses. Let's keep going. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like war horses, they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. They've been brought together to do this. These enemies of the people of God, remember? Before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. I appreciate the use of synonyms. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their path. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the cities. They run upon the walls. They climb into the houses. They enter through the window like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withhold their shining. An army's coming for the people of Israel. It, it is something that they were accustomed to. It is something that they dealt with regularly. It was something that was always present for them. In the part of the world where Israel is today, it is always present. The ideas of some of the things that we view as terrorist attacks that throw us into an uproar, they call that Tuesday. It's every single day. There is a fear always on red level alert. But the people of Israel in this passage are always on red level alert. Destruction's coming, destruction's coming. But, They've been promised the day of the Lord. So, so hear me say this. We're not exactly sure as to who this army is that's coming for them. But let me liken it to something. We're here in America, land of the three, free, home of the brave, explosions on Friday. It is the equivalent, regardless of who's coming, of us seeing North Korea... And Syria coming for us to destroy everything. And there's nothing that we can do about it. That's what we're dealing with here in Joel chapter 2. But remember, they've got a promise. The great and glorious day of the Lord. He will rescue. He will save. He will stop the hand of our oppressor. The Lord utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great he who executes his word is powerful for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome who can endure it For his purpose, God leads the armies of whatever enemy nation Israel had towards their destruction. If you read through Joel chapter 2 with that in mind, you see that the great and glorious day of the Lord ain't what we're God bringing vengeance and wrath upon an unrepentant people. We're pretty quick to hop on unicorns ourselves. To make the coming of the Lord about us 
about him meeting our needs, about him making us live in a better world. If there is any group of people that reflects throughout history what the Israelites were about to receive due to their blindness to their lack of desire for the things of God and for their religiosity, which is not a word, but we'll let it be one. It's us. Wrath is coming, is what Joel said. This is the equivalent, in 1994, the greatest sports movie ever made came out. It was called Space Jam. (laughs) And if you don't know the storyline, I apologize. You don't even have to Wikipedia it. I can give you this. In 2000, I worked at an after-school care program, and I made... These kids watch this movie every week, every day. And um, the, the storyline is this, that the Monstars, which sounds petrifying, they come and they absorb all of the powers of the greatest basketball players of their generation. When I say greatest basketball players, the only ones they could get to sign a contract. Like Muggsy Bogues, he was five foot three, But besides that, he, he couldn't play very well. Uh, anyway, so they, the, the Monstars absorbed the powers of Patrick Ewing. Anybody remember Patrick Ewing? Flat hair, poof. Uh, and then Larry Johnson, Grandmama, and uh, Muggsy Bogues, and, and Charles Barkley. Their powers are absorbed. And then the, the Looney Tunes come around. We, we remember Looney Tunes? Anybody remember that? Bugs Bunny, what's up, Doc? And... They get a team together to fight off the Monstars, and they, their leader is Michael Jordan. So if we're talking about Looney Tunes here, and, and we're them, this is the equivalent of Michael Jordan playing for the Monstars, leading the Monstars. Th- that's what takes place here in this passage. God is saying to the nation of Israel, you lax, unrepentant, disgraceful, unfathomably ignorant people. I am going to bring judgment, but that judgment has a purpose. And then God says this in verse 13. You guys are like, Chad, is this the best 4th of July sermon you could have picked? I love verse 12. In the midst of God saying, I'm coming to destroy you. He lets them know that that destruction has intent and purpose. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your garments. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's throughout the Bible. He relents over disaster. God says to the nation of Israel, The army is coming down on you. But even now, if you will look at me for who I am and not less than that, then I will hold this back. He'll eventually say, I'll punish them. Rend your garments is a very important phrase throughout the Old Testament. You see it when when Saul and his son Jonathan, they get into a disagreement. Jonathan rends his garment. It's a symbolic picture of, I'm going to, God, there, there is an untruth that's here, and I want to acknowledge you in the midst of it. Rend your garments. If you look through the story of King David and all of his sons and the Netflix documentary that that is, you, you see that, The idea of of rending your garments happens over and over with Absalom who has has offended his father and offended his father's family in every way, shape, and form. Absalom, the son of David. When he has done this, what he does at one point is he rends his garment and then he goes back to being a cocoa puff. He is insane. And what God says to us from Joel chapter 2 is this, I don't want you to tear up your clothes. I want you to tear up your hearts. Because the heart in the scriptures is, is 
especially the Old Testament. It's a picture of your complete being and what he's saying to the nation of Israel and what he's saying to us if we're being really honest about this. Your whole everything is devoted to something besides me, so tear that up. You you are giving lip service to me, and you're giving lip service to my mission, and you're giving lip service to my goals. You're giving lip service to everything apart from me. So stop. Stop. And if God would say anything to us today, it would be stop. Giving lip service to everything besides me. You keep coming to me and all you want stuff. Your life is not about getting stuff. I was seminary was terrible. I, I dated uh, one or two girls. Um, didn't work out. Hopes way better than they were. Anyway, like hopes awesome and they were. Pfft. But one girl I went on a couple of dates with. Um, we went on our first date and, and that was fun. We went to dinner. And we got coffee. That's pretty much how it works when you're at a Southern Baptist seminary. Dinner and coffee, man, it's like running with scissors. So we're, we're going to... First date was great, you know. She wasn't super fun. She was pretty. So uh, second date, we, we planned. And, and when we went on the second date, I decided to, to take her to the Cheesecake Factory. And that was in Dallas, which meant that I had to drive 30 minutes, which was fine. So we, we load up in my 1995 Ford Ranger. And you wonder why she didn't want to stay with me. But when we drive, uh, we get to the Cheesecake Factory. We, we park, and I take her inside. And she ordered something far too expensive for a seminary student to pay for. and But I, I did. And we enjoy our meal, and then we order our cheesecake, and they bring you these big pieces of cheesecake that are unreal. So I ordered mine, she ordered hers, and we head back to my house where all of our friends are hanging out. And what I mean by all of her friends, our friends, all of my friends, because they don't know this girl. But when we walk into the house, we're hanging out with these random people th- to her, and she has placed her leftover cheesecake in my refrigerator, and I have placed my leftover cheesecake. Uh, there wasn't any leftover. But I... <laughs> So everybody leaves that night, and we're sitting on the front porch, and um, we're having a conversation, and then we're having this conversation about, you know, our relationship and lack thereof. And, and I said, so this is cool. She said, yeah, this is cool. So we go back and forth with that for a minute. I said, do, do you want me to keep calling you? And she said, I would love to do that. And then I thought, wow, she, this, she, she likes me. She really likes me. So um, I said, so do you think we could go somewhere with this? And that, she just kind of stopped me. She said, oh, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I, somebody just, oh, guys, I'm okay. <laughs> she said, no. I said, what do you mean? She said, yeah, I just, I just, I need to make new friends. I said, that's cool. I got plenty of friends. I'll holler at you on the flip side. So it's college football season, and I'm sitting in my living room the next day with a group of my buddies. And they're consoling me as much as you console someone over a girl you went on two dates with. And we hear a knock on the door, and I look through the peephole, and there she was. And <laughs> I, I opened the door, a- and she came in, and she sat down with us, and she laughed at my jokes for a minute, not because she liked me, but because I'm funny. And when sh- she's sitting beside me, and we're chatting it up, and then... I realized why she was there. She wasn't there for me. She was there to get her leftover cheesecake. (laughs) She was not there for me. She was there for what I had given to her. Joel chapter 2. God comes to a place where he says, rend your hearts, not your garments. And what he's saying is, don't just be here because you expect the day of the Lord to be great and glorious in regards to what you get be here for me rend your hearts not your garments return to the lord for he is gracious and merciful he is slow to anger he is abounding in love and he relents over disaster who knows whether he will turn and relent and leave so that's a great question who knows what god will do if his people repent who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him and a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Verse 15, blow your trumpet. 
consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate a congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Don't know what they're going to do, but they're coming. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. He says, whatever you're doing, stop doing it and fall down before me and trust me. So in the midst of your busy, because we're all busy, God says, stop what you're doing. Don't stop going to work. But stop making your life about your work. Don't stop taking care of your kids. But stop treating your kids like they're gods. D don't stop, and the list can go on and on. Don't stop doing everything, but consecrate your heart. That word, it says twice here, set apart your heart for what your heart was created in origin to do. Set your hearts apart. Verse 17. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. That just, don't let them talk about you in past tense, but let them see you in the present. Why should they say among the people, this is the byword, where's their God? So, he says through Joel, if the people are going to keep going about the business of doing to do and saying to say and acting to act and reacting to react and all that, then ultimately, what will be said about them is, where's their God in the midst of that? To the generation of Christians globally today, I'm not talking to a country, I'm talking to the people of God. We find that many of us go about the business of doing to do and acting to act and saying to say and interacting to interact. We do those things. How often does media say about us? Where's their God in that? Like that's the nature and tone of every news feed about what has been labeled a hypocritical bunch of people. Where's their God in that? Is he even there? Consecrate yourselves, set yourselves apart, gather to gather, gather everything. Stop doing the, the busyness of busy and see that God has set you apart in the midst of what you're doing for kingdom purposes and kingdom reasons. Well, Chad, what do you mean? You're talking kingdom. We're, we're, we're Jesus people. I hope so. You're talking this kingdom. Well, let, let's look at this. You, you hold your place. You just hold in Joel because... He yells at you a lot, and sometimes we need yelled at. But Luke chapter 17, this is what the, the Pharisees that Jesus came to, he talked to them. Here was the word that Jesus had for them. Luke 17, verse 20, write this down. Make this a quiet time at some point this week. Being asked by the Pharisees, the religious people who'd somehow missed God, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in the way that you can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is right here, you clowns, and you're missing it. And Jesus says to this generation who claims to follow after Jesus, the kingdom of God is in your midst, so live like it. Well, Chad, Jesus, he, 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 Prince of Peace, King of Kings, all, all that stuff. Well, it doesn't he just kiss babies and stuff like you talked about earlier? Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, but I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, 
and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of, who, of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me, he's not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Consecrate yourself because Jesus came with a sword to divide. His people from the frivolous stupidity that goes on around them. Consecrate yourselves in the midst of what you're doing. Because we have a king who has said, everything is for my purpose. And I will do whatever I need to do to help you to see that. Even now, repent. What if we were a repentant people? realizing the the utter dumbness of some of the things that we do in the name of God while overlooking the God whose name we're speaking of. Even now, repent. Don't give lip service by tearing your garments. Tear your hearts. Because the king comes to divide with a sword. Are we with him? Not lip service with him, but really, really with him. You bow your heads and stand with me today.